Yes. <laughs> okay, so first of all, this is so cool. This is the largest group that we had. And we have not counted yet, but we had 73 people sign up, and there are more of you than this. So this is fantastic. I know that there are a number of you who have been to the first and the second, or the first or the second, um, which is also excellent. I'm in very encouraged. Um, <laughs> We're very encouraged by this. Um, those of us who are, have been working to form the pollinator pathway in town, um, this to us uh, shows that what we're trying to do is the right thing. Um, and I see lots of head nodding, and, and this is just, it's outstanding. Um, I want to make sure that everybody knows that um, we do have a Facebook page that uh, can be followed. We post a lot of information on there, and as we're doing more and more with the town, um, you'll be seeing projects that we're working on and that we need volunteers for. And, um, we've been, we're sort of reaching that stage where there was lots of setup and talking and that kind of thing, and now we're getting into the, oh, this is really cool, we can do this. Um, so, and when you're seeing that and doing it in your yards at the same time, this is what it's all about. This is what makes a difference. This is what we all need to do. And it's really inspiring to see all of you here because you care so much and you want to learn more. And that's outstanding, that is fantastic. Um, I do my little spiel every time. If you want to let your neighbors know um, that your yard is on the pathway, this is a great way to do this. Um, the money that we raise through this goes directly back to projects, um, paying for plants and all sorts of things so that um, you know that if you're supporting us this way, um, the money will be well spent. Um, and we recently, there are a number of people who signed up the last time um, that they were interested in getting a sign. And we've been posting pictures on our Facebook page of the people who have been stopping by and picking them up. And what's really awesome is people are liking it and saying, that's my neighbor. And I've actually gotten a couple of emails from people who saw the pictures who want to do the same thing. So again, your participation in this makes a huge difference. Um, there are two people who will be passing around, uh, as we always do, a sign-up sheet. If you have attended before, you just, just put your name down. I don't need all the rest of your information. Um, if this is your first time, if you wouldn't mind filling it out completely, that would be very helpful. Um, we will, as soon as we have sort of critical mass, we'll be sending out a newsletter uh, with more information. Um, so anything that, that uh, you do to let us know who you are and how to get in touch with you, that's really helpful. There are two places for an X. If you want to put, yes, I have, I'd like to volunteer, that's fantastic. Not that I probably won't be emailing the people who didn't check that box. And so <laughs> um, but also, if you do want to sign um, and you don't have one yet, just check the box off. I also want to um, welcome people that we, we have been getting people who don't live in Simsbury. And that's also great um, because the whole purpose of a pollinator pathway doesn't stop um, when you get to the border of a town. Um, so the, the more work that's done in this town and then expands into other towns, um, that's what it's all about. That's why we do this. So um, if you are here from another town and, and um, you don't have a group working on a pollinator pathway, you can always get in touch with me um, through uh, Facebook or uh, I posted on my email address, um, and we'll help you get started. Um, and you know what? You can use this design, because this is what it's all about. So um, thank you again for coming. We're gonna have the same format that we usually do, which is we'll stop around eight o'clock. Um, and then if you have questions, um, save your questions till then. Um, we have till about 20 after, and that's when the library gets a little cranky about everybody being here. So um, actually, it's really funny. The last two times, it's been 8.20, and I've just done this. And everybody gets all the leaves. <laughs> like, boom. So thank you for that. Um, I want to introduce Kyle Testerman, who is a member of the Cedric Pollinator Pathway Board. Um, Kyle is a DEEP wildlife expert, um, and he loves native bees. So he's here to tell you all about them. So thank you. coming. Um, my name is uh, Testerman. I'm a wildlife biologist from the DEP, but uh, bees are not what I do at work there. Bees are kind of a passion of mine that, that I've started recently. Uh, I'm a 
just in the last few years. So I'm not a bee expert, I'm a bee enthusiast, and I hope tonight that you guys all leave here as bee enthusiasts as well. Uh, my title, the title of my program is called Native Bees in Your Backyard. So I'm gonna be talking about the bees that regularly you can see in your backyard uh, throughout the growing season. An introduction to the often overlooked bees. I hope to basically introduce you and the bees to you um, and I'm gonna introduce probably five or six of the big major groups of bees that you're most likely going to see in your backyard, introduce you to them. So when you see them this spring, summer, fall, you know who they are, you're not gonna be afraid of them, uh, and you'll be able to appreciate a couple of things about them. First off, uh, we're gonna go through what a bee is. I'm gonna talk about why native bees are important and what is a native bee. Uh, the bee life cycle, the natural history of bees, we're going to focus on those uh, major groups of bees that you'll likely to see in our area. We're going to talk about a couple of non-bee bees. When people think of bees, they often think of things that aren't actually bees. And then some of the conservation, uh, points of conservation and threats for our native bees. So what are bees? <coughs> bees are insects. All right, hopefully everyone at least knew that part, that bees are insects. <laughs> they go through the same uh, they've got a head, thorax, abdomen, the kind of stuff that you learned in elementary school about bees when you colored in a diagram. Bees are in the insect order Hymenoptera, which is similar to the same order as ants, sawflies, wasps. The bees belong in that group. They share a common ancestor with apoid wasps, which are a group of wasps, for about 140 million years ago. So bees really evolved from uh, an ancient group of wasps. Um, they evolved to exploit the floral resources that trees were starting to offer, and there was a mutual um, evolutionary relationship between flowering plants and bees. What differentiates bees from other insects? Well, bees are pretty easy to identify because they're hairy. All right, those hairs we're going to talk about are meant to uh, help collect pollen more easily. Uh, they typically have a more compact shape, and they kind of have pollen collecting structures. They're kind of two main pollen collecting structures that a couple different groups of bees have, and I'll point out which groups have which. Bees and wasps have two sets of wings, so that's one way you can differentiate them from uh, flies. Bees and wasps have two compound eyes, those big eyes on the side. They also have three ocelli, which are uh, three smaller uh, eyes on the forehead. You can see the three eyes right here, the ocelli here, and the two compound eyes. This bee here, these aren't just big beefy legs, these are legs covered in hairs that are now color covered in sticky pollen. So that's some of the unique things that uh, help you differentiate a bee from any other flying insect that you might see. The life cycle of most bees, well, as insects, they go through a complete metamorphosis. They go through an egg stage, a larval stage, a pupa, and then they're finally adults. And the adult is what probably we're all most familiar with, adult bees. But they go through these, uh, these other stages and most of their actual life is spent more in the, uh, those other stages for the most part. Um, bees also, their life cycle depends on the type of, the level of sociality that they have. Bees, depending on the species, can be social, where they have overlapping generations, uh, sort of like what you'd find in a colony. And often what people think of uh, regarding honeybees living in a colony. Honeybees are an example of social bees, but they're not the only ones that are social. There's a few other groups of species that are social. Uh, so they have overlapping ge generations, they have a division of labor, a hierarchy, and they take uh, cooperative care of their offspring. There's also semi-social bees, so kind of some variation of that, where instead of a queen, there's what's called a foundress. Uh, and they lay, uh, they're responsible for the egg laying, and the sisters take care of the brood. So it's not a queen and then daughters, it's a foundress and their sisters. There's also communal nesting, communal uh, nesting behavior where uh, bees independently dig their own nest site, um, uh, the nest entrance, they take care of it, they lay their eggs in it, they, take, they bring pollen for their offspring, but they share a nest entrance with other bees of the same species. So the shared nest entrance, uh, but independent brood rearing. And then there's solitary bees, which is what most bees most native bees are, they're solitary. They, uh, it's a single female who does it all in four to six weeks. They dig their own nest, they lay their eggs, they get all the provisions, all the pollen that they need. Uh, they will, in some cases, stay and defend their nest from parasites, uh, and then they, then they die. So that's the majority of our native bees. 
Lastly, then there's parasitic bees, which don't bother digging a nest. They just find some other bee that's already done the work, lay their eggs in that nest, and they make sure that their eggs develop faster and eat the other uh, bees' eggs and all the pollen that they saved up for them. Those are around us, and they're pretty cool to see as well. Um, seasonality, the life cycle. Seasonality, uh, it, the life cycle of the bee depends on which season that they're active in. Some bees are active throughout all the growing season. Other bees are only active for a few couple weeks in the spring, others in the fall, others in the summer. So it really depends, that life cycle depends on, um, on what type of, when, when they're active. Where are bees nesting? We often think of bees, most often we think of honeybees, nesting in a hive, above ground somewhere in a hive, um, but the reality is most of our bees, 70% of the bees that we have, nest below ground. They dig tunnels on their own or they use existing tunnels that their parent dug, so their natal tunnels, or they find a, a existing burrow from a, an insect or something else, a beetle, that's dug that hole and they'll use it once it's vacant. They all have different soil preferences. Um, and something really unique that most of these bees do is they, through a gland, can secrete some type of waterproofing compounds to keep their eggs safe and the pollen safe from, from exposure. So they'll, they'll provision their nest with the pollen, they'll seal it up uh, with this waterproofing, which uh, helps because you can you visualize nesting in the ground, you're probably prone to flooding. So this is a really important thing that helps prevent uh, loss of your nest over and over. 30% of bees nest above ground. Uh, they'll live in cavities, so broken off stems, uh, the pithy uh, stems of, of decaying plants, uh, they'll dig into rotten wood. They'll use existing beetle uh, burrows in rotting wood. But the majority nest below ground, and they do so solitarily. And what is a native bee? Well, a native bee is a bee that's endemic to our area since as long as we've been keeping records. So really since before European colonization. An introduced species was brought here either intentionally or unintentionally to a new place by humans. And there are several species of introduced spe of bee in Connecticut. Native bees, though, are responsible for, the, for many, many different plant animal uh, interactions that exist beyond uh, just what benefits the bees. Why are we so concerned about native bees in particular? Well, native bees have co evolved over eons with our native plants through mutualistic relationships. Cross pollination between, from bees through other plants has led to increasing genetic diversity among plants, which helps them be more resilient to changes and environmental changes, uh, adds to plant diversity as well. Other species benefit from uh, the bee-pollinated plants. Think of all the berries and the seeds that are produced by pollination. Who's eating all those? Birds, among other things. So if you like your birds, you have bees to thank for that. Uh, native bees are also the most efficient and effective pollinators for many of the crops that we have introduced honeybees, which I'm going to talk about towards the end, they can't do something called buzz pollination, which is a type of pollination that really shakes a lot more of the pollen off of the flower and gets it accessible to them and is important for, uh, for that pollination for good, strong uh, crop set or fruit set. They're really a lot more efficient than honeybees as well. 300 mason bees, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, can do the work of 90,000 European honeybees. Introduced bees can also uh, help spread introduced plants. It's one of the one of the problems is these introduced bees are more familiar with the plants of the old world where they came from, and so they will uh, they're kind of re somewhat responsible for some of the spreading of invasive plants. The bottom line is, the more biodiversity we have, by the more native bee species that we have, the more stable and functional our ecosystems are. The first group of bees that I'm going to introduce you guys to are the minor bees. Minor, not minor, they're still really important, is in the family Andrinidae. This is the largest family of bees worldwide. There's over 550 species in the US alone. There's dozens in Connecticut, but they are all very, very hard to differentiate. And one of the takeaways from this is you don't have to identify the species. You don't need to, you know, for the most part, unless you're under a microscope, you won't be able to identify the species. But just having an appreciation for the general family or the type of bee that you're looking at can really help um, help garner that appreciation for them and help you value them more in your yard. So most of the mining bees that we have are in the genus Andrina, 
This isn't going to be a taxonomy lesson, but it's just helpful to keep them straight. These are called minor bees because they dig straight down into the ground. A lot of the species have different soil preferences, uh, but they dig straight down into the ground at least a foot, sometimes up to three feet deep, tunnel straight into the ground. There's a variety of specialist bees that focus on a certain family of plants, uh, and then there's also generalist bees that can feed over a longer season on a variety of plant types. Most of these species are only active for a short period of time throughout the year, uh, and most only have one generation. So the female will, uh, will emerge, mate, um, collect pollen, lay eggs, and then die within a short period of time. Those eggs will develop over the year, and then they'll emerge the following year as adults themselves. So they only have one generation the entire year. Some of the bees that uh, you'll see in first stop in the spring when we start to thaw out and we start to get some um, plants blooming are gonna be these spring minor bees. Hawthorne minor, neighborly minor, and Carolina minor are three of the common species that we have around here. There's many, many others, um, but they're very important pollinators for the spring fruits. Often in the spring, the first blooms are from trees and shrubs, because those are all this energy that's already stored up in the spring. A lot of the herbaceous plants take longer to bloom, and they bloom later in the spring through the summer and fall. Uh, we can thank minor bees for our cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, and a lot of our apple yields that we have, and the, the strong crop pollination that we get. Something distinct about minor bees, if you start to look for them, is this kind of pattern here, the folds, that you'll see this dark, light, dark, light, dark. The eyes are on the side, and then it has these light patches of hair on the side. Almost all the minor bees have that. <coughs> These are blueberries that are going to be pollinated by this Carolina minor bee. Um, got it in the air. In the fall, there's another set of specialist minor bees that come out. They emerge when the uh, asters and the goldenrod bloom. Asters and goldenrod are in the same family, Asteraceae. So those flowers, they've developed a mutualistic relationship with, with those plants. The aster mining bee, the hairy banded miner, and the cloudy winged miner bee are bees that you will only see in August, September, maybe into October, and these are them here. They are all distinct, and I think if you start to look by the fall, when you're also excited about bees, you have several months to learn them, <laughs> you will be able to identify these very easily. All right, so at least go, oh, that thing looks different, that thing looks different. Let me look at what, you know, what fall bees there were. Those will stand out. The next big group of bees are the sweat bees. In this family, Helictidae. They're called sweat bees because a few of the groups of them uh, are known to feed on human sweat to get some nourishment, some salts, nothing to fear. <laughs> but the group is called the sweat bees. They're very gentle. You probably haven't even noticed if it's on you before. You probably just thought it was a little fly. They're a large family, though, with many unique, identifiable genera and species. So these ones were actually, you should probably be able to, within a couple months of learning them, be able to differentiate a few of these major families that we have. Almost all of them are generalists, so most of them are active throughout the growing season because they can switch depending on which uh, pollen source is available. Most have about one generation, but you can they can have two or three as well. Most are solitary, but some are communal. And there's some very unique bees here that also have a social structure similar, uh, similar to some of the other social bees like honeybees and some of the bumblebees. Sweat bees have scopal hairs, which are those big hairs on their hind legs. They get filled up with pollen. So a bee that's laden with pollen will look like it has these big, big yellow saddlebags on them. Uh, that's the pollen that they've clung to, those scopal hairs. Most of these bees can buzz pollinate. That's uh, that buzzing of, that, of their wings, which creates sort of a hypersonic um, movement and sound, which triggers a release of a lot more pollen for them. And a lot of uh, our tomato plants, they depend on buzz pollination for a proper fruit set. One genus is the Agapostomin bees, which are the striped green sweat bees. These all have kind of similar common sounding names. That's why a lot of uh, bee experts still stick to the Latin name. These are the striped green sweat bees. We can go with that for now. There's several local species. Uh, and they're the most, uh, most of them though are indistinguishable from each other. So just keeping in mind these striped green sweat bees. This is a female bicolored sweat bee, and she's pretty much the only one that you can identify just by looking at her. This 
green body, and then the black and white stripes along the abdomen are unique to female bicolored sweat bees. You'll see a lot of them probably out there when you start growing your native plant gardens, uh, and they're a really, really cool bee to see moving all around. The other females of the other three species look pretty much identical. I'll show you an example. They're too hard to differentiate unless you're an expert with a microscope or a magnifying glass and you have a specimen in the hand. The males also all look alike, but they don't appear until later in the season. There's no reason for males to be breeding. They breed at the end of the season, then the female will go and uh, overwinter uh, before emerging and laying her eggs later. They nest in the ground in a variety of soil types, uh, but generally they're solitary. Some of them are communal, or they'll be in aggregation. So if there's the right soil type, you'll find a lot of solitary individual tunnels in the ground there. They'll have one to two generations per year. These are the males, and I don't know which species, but they're all, because they all look, they're too similar to differentiate. They have that metallic green head and thorax. Most male bees have long antennae. It's another good way to tell them apart. They have, instead of black and white, it's black and yellow striping here. So if you look quickly, you might have thought it was a yellow jacket or some kind of wasp, but if not, it's a male uh, sweat bee. Male bees of all types have no stingers, they can't sting you, um, so nothing to worry about there either. And something else that's unique between these two is the hair. Most male bees, especially male sweat bees, have little to no hair on them because they're not trying to collect pollen to store in their nests. They're just visiting flowers to defend a little territory, find a female, and to drink nectar. So this is the bicolored sweat bee, just on a, an echinacea flower. You can see it passing the pollen onto those back legs. And a lot of these pictures, some of them are with you know a real camera that I had, but a lot of them are also just with a cell phone. Video, you can get you can get right up to you know all the bees that are around your garden. Uh, they're not they don't care about you. You're not going to bother them. So it's pulling the pollen that's the flowers offering up and floating them onto the legs. This is a female of the other group of species. The other three are the Texas striped sweat bee, the silky striped sweat bee, and the brown winged sweat bee. This is what the female looks like. Very similar. It's kind of a green and white banding. So it doesn't stand out like the bicolored striped sweat bee. The next group of sweat bees, which are really, really unique, and probably one of the most abundant native bees that you're gonna see and you're gonna notice at first when you start looking for bees. They're generalists and they're often seen on sunflowers, echinacea or coneflowers, uh, and on a whole variety of other things. They go for, some of them can be solitary, they can be communal, they also can be social with a hierarchy and a foundress, up to 200 workers. So that's really, really unique among our native bees and sweat bees in general. You can be solitary and do everything yourself, or you can be a part of this 200 worker colony, all in the same area. Uh, the foundress, again, that's different than a queen. A foundress still is a higher level hierarchy, but usually it's sisters that are helping uh, do the brood rearing and collecting the pollen, and the foundress is the one responsible for the egg laying. Uh, they begin egg laying in the spring, and usually if they're going to be social and, and have kind of a colony, they'll have multiple generations in that year. The subordinate females do uh, keep the ability to lay eggs, so if something were to happen to the, the foundress and she were to die, another female can start laying eggs. Typically they will have um, black, brown bodies, they have this black and white striping along the abdomen that's really unique, really uh, helps them stand out and they have a compact shape. This one too has these large, has pollen all over the back legs on those scopal hairs. This is the genus Halictus, also called the furrow bee. So we have the ligated furrow bee, confusing furrow bee, orange legged furrow bee, and <laughs> parallel striped furrow bee. If you can identify it to a sweat bee, great. <laughs> You're not gonna, I, I can't identify these. Um, you know, I use, I'll talk about the app iNaturalist later. I let bee experts tell me what I've seen. But the elygated furrow bee is the most common one that we have around here. Uh, they're the ones that are most likely to have the bigger social structure. So these two are ligated furrow bees. They're probably sisters collecting pollen for the same, uh, for the same nest. This is an orange-legged furrow bee. 
Uh, it has the orange legs, you can see, but it still has that black and white banding on the back. <coughs> the next group of sweat bees. These are ones, uh, the Lacia glossum, these are ones that are more likely to be seen on you collecting sweat in the summer. It's kind of why they get their name. Many of them are generalists, uh, but they, and they come in different sizes, very small to larger. Uh, some are only active early in the spring, others later in the year, others throughout the whole uh, growing season. They nest generally in the ground, but some also nest in dead wood. Uh, they might use rotten stumps, rotten logs, existing beetle tunnels. Um, and they're, again, solitary, communal, and social. Very unique to be able to do all that in one species, depending on uh, the situation. If they're uh, more social, they'll have more within one generation in a year. If they're solitary, they'll probably have one generation in a year, and depending on the species, too. There's two groups. Again, I don't mean to get bogged down in the Latin. It's not gonna, you're not gonna care about the taxonomy, but it just helps you realize that you might be looking at two things that are very, very closely related that look different. These dialectus ones, they're very abundant. Once you start looking around, this is one that's getting sweat. They're kind of a metallic-y, greenish, dark, very small, and they're abundant. They are everywhere when you look, when you start looking for them. 